The householder trial begins. Welcome to Columbus on the Record, saying Larry Householder sold the State House. Prosecutors this week began to lay out their bribery case against the former House Speaker. The federal trial of Householder and lobbyist Matt Borges began this week in Cincinnati. Prosecutors began to present in great detail how money flowed from First Energy to Householder in return for him guiding passage of a nuclear bailout bill. Householders' attorneys said the money trail is not proof of bribery. They argued there was no quid pro quo. They claim Householder pushed for the bill to save jobs and to support a diverse energy system for the state of Ohio. Andrew Tobias, aside from three days of testimony being canceled because a juror got COVID, were there any surprises as this trial got underway? I would say there weren't really any surprises. That's, that is certainly one of the things that we're looking for as we go down, just because this story obviously involves a lot of players in Columbus, and we're wondering who might kind of get dragged into it and stuff like that. But really, the people that the government laid out they're likely to call to testify was pretty much who we expected. I'd say the one thing that I was wondering going in is why were they calling Attorney General Dave Yost to testify? Um, and they said during their opening statements, basically, that one of the reasons they called in Matt Borges, who's a lobbyist, who's one of the co-defendants in the case, uh, why they got him involved with the House Bill 6 campaign was his relationship with Dave Yost. Uh, Borges and Yost go back. He's a, he used to be a close political advisor. He knew him for a long time. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, kind of shed some light on that. But by and large, this, uh, this uh, situation has kind of played out in public for years. And so at this point, we'll see what the actual testimony brings. And maybe, you know, if everybody's okay and COVID is, is vanquished, then we might see some more. Larry Householder, Karen, the question was, would he testify? He told reporters that he'd like to. Doesn't mean he will, but he'd like to, he said. Yeah, it doesn't mean he will. And I think that's important to not count on that happening, even though we can't see what's happening in the courtroom, which is really disappointing that we can't see video, no pictures, no, no uh, audio recording. So we're having to rely on people like Andrew and my State House News Bureau colleague, Andy Chow, to tell us what's going on. We have seen Householder, of course. He kind of makes a public show when he shows up uh, last week, showing up in a Bengals hat as yeah. he walked in, just getting in the spirit of that. But uh, I, I think it's going to be interesting to watch to see who does testify, state lawmakers like Dave Greenspan and, and others, who, Jay Hottinger from the Newark area, also on that potential list. So this is going to be something to pay attention to, I think. Joe Moss, the defense strategy, we know what the prosecutors have said. They've been saying it all along. Now we get, to, for the first time, really get to hear the defense, how they're going to try to say this is not a bribe. This was just the way politics is. What do you think of their strategy, and will it work? It's the only strategy that they can have, Mike. It's kind of a narrow path. I think at the end of the day, I think those that would consider the defense favorably are going to have to navigate the reality that there, are, there is money involved in, in political, I don't want to use the word transactions, but, but certainly in the, in the political world. Most of it, 90% of the time or more, it's legitimate. It's the way that people get elected and get their campaigns funded. But you can step over the line and the line is very, very small, very narrow. In recent years, Gene, it's been hard I mean, because of a Supreme Court decision in 2016 with the former governor of Virginia. They threw out his conviction because they said they did, this, this wasn't quid pro quo. This was just the way the system works. You give money to gain influence. Yeah. And, um, I mean, sometimes if you're going to do a show and you get a bunch of recovering politicians on, we will tell you stories that will cure, that will just curl your hair. OK. Um, and uh, yeah, this is this is this has been this has been pro forma for a large number of years. The other going back to the Bob McDonald case, yeah, uh, Virginia, former governor, yep. former governor uh, he's left with a 20 million dollar legal fee. And so I look at that and that's common knowledge. And yes, he got acquitted. But um, no, I, I think I really suggest you do a whole show because I could tell you five or six tales of direct bribery occurring. Really? And well, you, could, you could see, there's paper, paper trails around it. I think the defense counsel is very brave here. Uh, they may very well be very wise, but they don't know what those witnesses are going to say. And you talked also about Householder wanting to take the stand. 
You don't know how he's going to come across when they ask him, are you meaning to tell us that you received a $400,000 loan and it had nothing to do? That's going to be, that reaction is going to be critical. Andrew, Matt Borges, he's the lobbyist, kind of the second player to Householder, who was, of course, the Speaker of the House and one of the most popular, one of the most powerful men in state government. But Borges, former head of the GOP here in Ohio, he's accused of basically trying to, to bribing a, a worker from another campaign to give him dirt, give him information. And he's basically saying that Larry who? I don't know Larry Householder. Is that his defense? Yeah, he, he basically said that the two of them didn't get along, which is, which is true. People who cover politics, you know, I can attest to that. Uh, and he, he basically said if there was bribery involved with this, I wasn't a part of it. I wasn't really working for the same goals that they were. Um, it'll, you know, one thing I do want to say, though, is that you mentioned the, the bribe, the alleged bribe that took place. Um, often, you know, my, the way that I feel about political corruption cases is it, it's as much about the law as it is about perception. And so... Um, you know, when we're talking about what does Larry Householder look like when he's going on the stage, if people are going to say this is how politics works, it involves millions of dollars, it, you know, something that the defense said in their opening arguments was that the First Energy Solutions, the owner of these nuclear plants, of course, they had a lot. Of, they said they have a lot to financially gain from this. Of course, they would give lots of money to try to get this legislation through. I just don't know how that hits normal people. You know, maybe there's issues at the appellate level where you talk about the law and all that stuff. But a lot of it, you know, when it comes to jurors, as much about perception, it is about, about the law, in my opinion. Yeah. Um this could, this could, he could get convicted here, Karen, and it just could be could. appealed, like the governor of Virginia. Yeah. That was, went all the way to the Supreme Court before that conviction was thrown out. He could also be acquitted. And I think that that's really important because these corruption cases are hard to prove. And I think Andrew's absolutely right that there's the issue of the law versus the perception. And I know Householder to a lot of people comes off as very folksy. And I know he's been talking to reporters and people in the courtroom. And like I said, showing up in a Bengals hat, you know, trying to, to be one of the people. But is he going to come off that way to jurors? Is he going to come off as a typical politician, this is what they do, or is he just a, just a guy? So I think all of that potentially factors in, and I think that there's a really strong possibility. I mean, he has said he is innocent, so is Matt Borges. So there's always a possibility that they're going to be acquitted. Joe Boss, you're not involved in any of this, obviously, but Matt Borges apparently, according to the attorneys, was offered a six-month sentence in prison to plead guilty and to cooperate. Two other folks who were originally charged in this are cooperating. That's six months when he's facing years and years if he's convicted. That, that's a pretty thing, pretty, pretty good deal to turn down. Uh, that's, that's, you're, you're absolutely correct, and, and I face these kinds of decisions all the time in other cases, in yeah. other types of crimes, not necessarily this sort of thing. And uh, quite often the defendant will accept it. And that's particularly wise if you have an inkling as to what the testimony is going to be from the witnesses. He must feel that he, he feels he can get acquitted and not have to do any time, not have any, any, any penalties. I tell you, it's, it, it's hard for me to imagine um, that um, they're going to be able to get through that unscathed. Dark money, these campaigns, Generation Now, these 401c3s that you don't have to disclose who your donors are, that's on trial as much as these two gentlemen are, Gene. Do you expect any changes to come out of this? That we get this gets exposed during this trial, and then we got to tighten this up. We need more disclosure. Do you expect any big changes to come out of this trial? Watch me restrain my laughter. <laughs> um, look, this is look. The, if if big money, you heard me say this ad nauseum on the show. If big money is polluting the the political landscape in Ohio, you dilute the solution to pollution is dilution, and you dilute big money by increasing the campaign donation tax credit from $50 to $500. Now, what that does, it cuts leadership now out of the fundraising funnel, and they don't like that. So there's been, leadership over the years has, has pushed back and tried to get this eliminated. Total cost, if we were to do that in this, in this state, maybe 40 to $60 million, which is a rounding error in a $75 billion budget. Yeah. So. We'll see how this all turns out. The rift between Republicans in the Ohio House was on full display this week. In the usual routine vote for House rules and committee appointments, members of the two factions squared off right out in public on one side. Those that support State Rep. Derek Merrin, who was the original GOP favorite to become Speaker. On the other side, supporters of the actual Speaker, Jason Stevens. They include some two dozen Republican supporters and Democrats. Both Merrin and Stevens claim they are, they are the leaders 
of the Republican caucus. Gene Krebs, you've been through this. Is this, are we just seeing in public what usually happens in private when partisans are squabbling over who's going to be their next speaker? No, nothing like this has ever occurred. Usually, you've heard me joke before on the show, the very first thing they teach you when you arrive is how to count. <laughs> okay? And that's, but neither side is willing to admit the other side has counted. Um, and Stevens, you know, as long as he keeps the Democrats with him, and so far he's done nothing to dissuade them from doing that, he, he, gets, he gets over 50, and Marin does not. And in fact, if you look at the latest numbers I find most interesting on the, on the rules, now uh, Stevens had 35 yes votes on the rules, which says to me he's slowly peeling away the Marin folks. Carol, you were on the floor. How, how hard are these feelings? How deep is this rift? I think for some people it is significant. There is a feeling that this straw vote that was held in November was the one that Republicans should be held to. And so there's this concern of, well, wait a minute, didn't we decide this already? Uh, I mean, it's, we're talking about two conservative Republicans here. I mean, neither one of them is as a moderate really in any way, though Stevens was willing to reach out to Democrats to try to engage them on some of the issues they care about, for instance, education, and also this constitutional amendment. This would require 60 percent voter approval. Uh, to amend the Constitution. That needs to pass by Wednesday, February 1st, for it to go on to the May ballot. Democrats don't want to see that happen. And so I, Speaker Stevens held a uh, session with reporters today and said, that idea is not dead, but making the May ballot, that's, that's not going to happen, essentially. So I, I think knowing these things going into it, I think you're starting to see some people make decisions about who they want to side with, plus the rules package that was proposed, there were some things in there that really had some people upset. Yeah, Andrew, you, you and Karen both reported on this. One has said that um, only a Christian prayer could be said to start the session. Another one said that House members could carry guns on the House floor. Didn't go anywhere, it was just a draft. Is that an example of the Merrin side? Uh, I don't know that that was like central to the proposal that they're trying to put forward, although those were things that obviously had that happen would have been a pretty controversial vote. You know, Bill Seitz, who's not one to mince words, a Republican who's now in leadership, uh, said it was highly disrespectful to the Muslim and Jewish members of the General Assembly, much less their constituents, to try to put that forward. But things the Marin camp was looking for more broadly had to do with basically taking away the power that Stevens now has uh, and kind of distributing it among the different members of the Republican caucus. You know, not surprisingly, Stevens didn't go for that, really. So, yeah. the, and even the Democrats. And I think that that's yeah. the, the, the idea of having an alliance with the speaker who's going to help them potentially, if not get legislation they want through, but to avoid some legislation. Yeah. I think that's part of that. But there's, there are some points that Stevens conceded. Uh, one that I'm not exactly sure if there's a specific scenario that they were reacting to, but it basically says the speaker can't take away a member's parking space as punishment without <laughs> that member's approval. Uh, and then also kind of, Something that, uh, you know, more broadly that Democrats like, I guess, too, is that they uh, now will have the ability to set their own staff for their or their own salary for their staff. So there's sure. there's stuff in there for Democrats. And uh, besides the thing I mentioned about the Marin supporters, he also tried to appoint a lot of them to not only positions of his leadership, but also committee uh, chair positions. So he is more conciliatory on this. And I think that's probably why he got extra 12 votes or whatever it was. Well, from Republicans. Remains to be seen, Joe, if, if Democrats get their own get favorite parking spots, but what else do Democrats get out of this? Well, you know, let me, let me give you a roundabout answer to that. I, what I'm actually kind of interested in and perhaps even excited about is that you have a legislature at the state level, and I was hoping that I would see a similar thing in the U.S. House over the, the speakership, that has to recognize that the other side exists, just exists. And maybe that is the only way that we can fight our way out of this, this impasse that we find ourselves in multiple state legislators as well, legislatures, as well as in the U.S. House. Interesting. All right. Now that this House has gotten back to business, one of the first things on its agenda is to hear from the governor. Governor DeWine will give his State of the State address to a joint session of the legislature on Tuesday. 
The governor says he expects to lay out his priorities, his budget priorities, over the next two years. Karen Kessler, I love a great discussion about budget priorities like anyone else does, <laughs> but please tell me there'll be something else in this besides the budget. He told my Statehouse News Bureau colleague Andy Chow that that's really going to be a lot of, of what he's going to talk about. And, and he says he's going to try to slow down that, that the budget discussions had been going at 100 miles an hour in his first term. Now he's going to slow it down to about 50 miles an hour, which I'll be interested to hear what that exactly means. But he's talked about his priorities as being, you know, mental health and helping children. And uh, th these are the issues that really are things that are key for him. So that's what I expect a lot of the focus to be about. So it, it's going to be a standard state of the state speech, but whether he'll get the support of Republicans in the supermajority and Democrats remains to be seen. Andrew, any talk of legalizing marijuana, expanding medical marijuana, uh, Looking again at sports betting, maybe tightening up on gun re regulation, that won't be in the speech, you don't think? So the governor's been pretty tight-lipped about what he might talk about specifically when you talk to his staff. It's kind of his bread and butter stuff like mental health funding or, you know, you know, mothers and children and stuff like that. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if the governor, and I'm just not reporting this by sure. any means, but if he were to propose the you know, funding the higher levels of school funding, the, the so-called fair school funding plan that, you know, was previously passed. It doesn't fund it all the way through the next couple of years. But, you know, maybe something like the Senate President Matt Huffman has proposed, uh, and it failed during lame duck in December, trying to overhaul the state school board. You know, whether the governor proposes that uh, or whether that might come from the legislature and then get put into the budget later on, I could see that. Something like marijuana, the governor doesn't really go for that, so I would really doubt that. But, you know, we can always dream, I guess. <laughs> Joe, mental, talking about mental health stuff and things like that, it's all good news for Democrats. Fully supporting mental health services and that's, schools and after school correct. wraparound and I, services. I, and I, I, would, I would assume that he's, he's going to take a victory lap here also concerning the business that's coming into uh, Ohio. It's my understanding now that Amazon is also thinking of of building a, a new campus uh, here close to Columbus. So uh, he's got, I think, lots of things to, um, to say I did a good job. Uh, as far as what to do, and I think I don't think he's going to be particularly eloquent, like uh, Andrew was suggesting, on any other things. Now, I do think that marijuana will become recreational marijuana will become legal in the next two years. But Gee, how do lawmakers view the speech in Washington? The State of the Union address is where the president does lay out the priorities of the next year, and sometimes there are big initiatives in there, and people parse every word. Does that happen with the governor's state of the state no, address? No, and what is, what's going to happen this time is everything that's going on inside the building, picture it behind you, the state house, is going to be subsumed by what's happening in the federal courthouse down Cincinnati. Uh, what we saw when after Larry got arrested, you know, everything came to a grinding halt there for a while. And I expect everything. Last time I was on the show, I said there's going to be five scandals that are going to hit. Okay, well, a couple of them involved the trial. And when those come out, everything in that, in my beloved state house, is just going to, you're not going to have any, but the, talk about the budget will be pro forma. Everybody's going to run back and pay attention to their Twitter feed, fed by Karen and Andrew. <laughs> but the, the budget is, is an important, we, we, we joke about how boring it is, but it, let's face it, that's the, we pay taxes, it goes into the state budget, the, ta the state takes that tax money, and fund services. It must pass. I yeah. mean, it has to pass by important. June 30th, yeah. absolutely. And it, it does, uh, I think that some of the things to watch are the school funding proposal, because it was only funded for two years last time around. It was a six year phase in, so what happens with that is really important. Local government funding, you've got Speaker Stevens, who talks about being a local government guy. DeWine talks about being a local government guy. What is going to happen with local governments? I think that's something to watch as well. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's Dave Barry, the columnist, used to say that the only way people would do stories and broadcast about the budget is for the budget to be involved in a car crash. Yeah. That's, you know, unfortunately, that's the attitude people have, and yet it's really, really important. Yeah. And you're going to see, the, of course, the projections that they're going to make in June are important for this next two-year budget. And right now, projections are just sky high yeah, because of inflation. Let's get to that. Ohio state government is flush with cash. The state's so-called rainy day fund is nearly full. It has a balance of $3.5 billion, the largest in the state's history. Ohio and many other states have so much money because of three things. One, they got a lot of COVID money, COVID-related money from the feds over the past couple of years. Higher interest rates means higher, better investment earnings on those investments. 
and inflation means higher prices, and that means higher sales tax revenues, so long as Ohioans keep buying. Joe Mas, if you were governor, where would you use this surplus money, so to speak? Well, and I would certainly use it. I think that there are some programs that need to be, if, look, if, if this money is not spent, and of course, as a, as a Democrat, I'm looking at social programs. I think we've got too many people who are homeless. I think that the, everybody's recognizing now that the, we have a crisis concerning uh, rental and, and, and home uh, uh, prices. So uh, that would be an issue, and, and I think that should be spent. But the real problem here is that the state does not spend it. All, and they cut taxes and so on, all that's going to happen is that people are still going to demand services and it's going to fall to the counties and to the local municipalities. Andrew, what is the talk, if there is any talk, with this, if there is a surplus and they have extra money, the rainy day fund is full, more or less, do they cut taxes? Do they look at infrastructure, money for water lines, things like that? I'll be interested to see if there is a discussion about cutting taxes because we now have basically the Senate and Republican, or I'm sorry, the Senate and House Republican leaders expressing an interest in phasing out the income tax, replacing it. And that's something that the governor was really not interested in doing when he first came to office. But Republicans laugh, love, love tax cuts. They passed one anyway. So, you know, whether the governor comes in the door looking for something like that, that that'll be interesting to see. It wouldn't surprise me if he were to try to push for some expansion of H2 Ohio, which is his water quality fund, which is not the sexiest issue, but people in Toledo dealt with an issue where Lake Erie turned green. They couldn't drink their water for a couple of weeks or something like that. So it, it's, a, it's an important issue. So I wouldn't surprise me if something like that in, in, with respect to infrastructure ends up, ends up in the budget. You have to figure there's some cities, not as bad as Flint, Michigan, Karen, but some cities need some help with their water piping infrastructure and mains and things like that. Oh, I think so. And uh, one of the things that Speaker Stevens was telling reporters today is that he's interested in looking at property tax structure. And so there's something there potentially I don't know. And, and also, once again, the local government issues and, and you know, jail funding and, and law enforcement at the local level and trying to back that up again. But there's no way that the rainy day fund is going to get tapped for anything. It's, it's just a question of what what the, the extra money that is available, what it's going to be spent on. And unfortunately, this is the last year of COVID funds. So this is a this is the last time. This is the, the, the end of it all, so to speak. Yeah, there's some fear, Gene, that with the COVID money ending, and they've been using that COVID money to fund a lot of these programs around the state, that suddenly they're going to have to continue these programs and there's no more COVID money. Yeah, and um, but what two things. Once again, money is rolling in due to a little bit to inflation and higher interest rates. Uh, but the other thing is then, then the state could do something that I've been calling for it to do for 30 years, which they've refused to do, which is reform. And they reform how you deliver these services who does them, and in what geographic area. And that's, if you want to really save some, just a few billions here and there, that's how you begin to do this. But they won't talk about that. But Joe, we, we could have another recession. People, economists keep saying yes. we're going to have a recession. The GDP keeps going up a little bit, but they say I, I, that I a recession on the horizon. We probably are going to have a planned recession because this is unfortunately how government works in trying to uh, overcome the, the challenges of inflation. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's going to, to probably happen. The rainy day fund, how full it can, there's a certain threshold. It can't go any certain above that. Will it reach that? For threshold, three and a half billion, that's a lot of money. And again, there's, yeah. I don't think that there's, I mean, we've all seen rainy days in the last, I've been here 19 years now, and, and opioid crisis and the budget crisis back in 2008 and all this stuff, and it's not been tapped yet. So I, I just wonder yeah. what, uh, what kind of rain do we need for it to ever be tapped? Well, Gene, if you recall, we had a rainy day fund. And we had a great recession in 2008. And then Governor Strickland dipped into that rainy day fund to pay the state's bills. And there were 89 cents left in it. And John Kasich won re-election largely because of that. Yeah. Is like any governor ever going to tap that rainy day fund now? How because it's going to get used against him. Watch me nerd out now for a moment. What you really want to do now is look at the average of the last recessions, the percent decline in the total revenue, and then apply that then to how long will that rainy day fund last over the length of time that a recession normally lasts, which is about 17 months. Yeah, it's like an emergency fund in your savings account. Right, exactly. How long? How long, if I'm unemployed, yeah. can this last me? That's the question you need to ask. 
The, and in the late 1990s, when Voinovich wanted to do a sales tax increase, I pointed out on the floor of the House, we have enough rainy day fund to last us for 444 days. Yeah. All right. Let's get to our final off-the-record parting shots. And Joe Moss, you're up first. Prediction. Expect a bill that was just introduced in the Senate to, re to reform driving under the influence law to take away the, the, what they have now, which is if you, taste, if you test positive for marijuana that you could have ingested 30 days before, you are per se guilty of driving under the influence. The new bill will allow you to argue that you were not impaired at the time and that the test was as a consequence of an earlier ingestion. All right, Gene. Uh, think tanker uh, Matt Mayer has announced his candidacy for governor in 2026. Uh, he is beloved by the Tea Party. I expect him to double Blystone's 19% at 38%. If Houston and Yost and Mayer are all on the ballot at the same time, Yost and Houston split the establishment vote, Mayer could easily be the Republican candidate. Andrew. Uh, so Gene mentioned earlier he tried not to fall over in laughter when he talked about the possibility of reform for campaign finance laws. Uh, something that I'm watching is that Derek Maron and all of his Republican supporters introduced a, a package of ethics reforms. And I'm interested to see really how those are handled, and particularly as we have these developments from the Householder try carrying out, what's the, what's the path forward for that legislation if there is one? And Karen. I'm glad Gene corrected me on the uh, 2008 recession and the rainy day fund there. But uh, a Republican supermajority, if it voted in a block, could pass emergency legislation at the state house that would go into effect immediately and would not be able to be overturned by voters. And that's one of the things that's not happening because you have this rift going on here. And I think that's an interesting thing in state law that could be happening that, that is not. Yeah, and it could lead to an abortion rights ballot question this November because they don't yeah. want to wait any longer. Anyway, that is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. We can see each episode on demand. Our website is wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.